Hi, I'm Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber, and today I'm here with someone who's been a very long time friend and colleague of mine. It's Carson Sweet, who is the founder and CEO of Cloud Passage. Carson, it's nice to see you, and I love the sweater. Thanks, Ed. I thought it would be a, a bit festive given the time of year. It's great to see you again, too. It is. We're, we're filming this um, at the end of 2020, so it's a good time to be wearing a nice uh, festive sweater. Car Carson, I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions about cloud security. <laughs> you, you know as much about that as anybody. But before we get in, tell, tell us a little bit about the company, and then um, then we can get into some tech. But um, what do you guys do at Cloud Passage? Sure. Sure. Uh, this this past year, we've been really uh, the, the two big areas we focused on is continuing to expand our uh, cloud security posture management solution, uh, which we call Cloud Secure. <clears throat> so as we see more adoption of uh, past services, uh, it's been important to expand the services that we support. Uh, so we've extended AWS and Azure uh, very extensively. Uh, and we've also added GCP. One of the things that we saw coming out of last year and into this year uh, was a more, you know, a meaningful production-oriented adoption of GCP. Uh, where previously there had been interest, some experimentation, uh, but maybe not quite as much, uh, you know, production adoption. Uh, so now that it's, you know, the, their platform is really catching up uh, in, in a lot of ways. People are understanding it. There's talent out there who understands it. We're seeing a lot of adoption now. So we uh, we're just about to release our GCP support for Cloud Secure. Uh, and the other area that we really focus a lot on this year uh, has been Kubernetes. So, of course, uh, with Docker a few years ago, uh, sort of hitting the mainstream, how to manage those containers, those microservices that you build from those containers has been a, a big topic and a big need. Uh, there was a bit of a, an industry battle, if you will, uh, between it was, it was almost akin to, you know, Windows 95 and, and OS 2. I know you'll remember that. Sure. Uh, uh, with, with Mesos sort of competing with Kubernetes, uh, and for all intents and purposes, to, to put it in simple terms, uh, Kubernetes won. Uh, so we've seen a lot of adoption of Kubernetes. I think a lot of the mainstream uh, you know, users were waiting to see what the early adopters were going to land on there, and Kubernetes was it. So we've added a lot of uh, assessment and monitoring and intrusion detection capabilities around Kubernetes deployments as, as well as the Docker environments. Uh, that's kind of the that those are the broad strokes of uh, what we've been up to this year uh, with the platform, and of course we just continue to scale uh, and, and develop more scalability and uh, core capabilities such as policy automation, uh, API endpoints. We continue to extend those, uh, you know, anytime we can. Yeah, Carson, just give us a little more about how the Kubernetes uh, security works. I think most people have gotten comfortable with the idea of containers and using Kubernetes to manage them. But what, what what's like what's missing in Kubernetes that needs to be added, say, for uh, cybersecurity? Well, how, how, how does that all work? It's a good question. And, and it depends on the Kubernetes deployment model that you're using. So one thing to keep in mind is you've got uh, what we call roll your own Kubernetes, where the customer will deploy a server, they'll you know uh, pick an operating system, they'll deploy uh, either Docker, you know, some, there's still mostly Docker out there. Uh, Kubernetes, the, the Google Kubernetes project recently announced that they would be deprecating Docker in favor of Container D. Um, that's actually not a replacement. That's, you know, if you think of Container D as the underpinnings of Docker and Docker just adding a lot of management capabilities and so on. On top of it, um, you know, if you take away sort of the extra stuff, uh, the idea is it makes things run faster. Uh, you know, and that's sort of a roll your own Kubernetes model where you deploy it yourself, you install the Kubernetes master software, or you install a Kubelet on the nodes, and you sort of build your own management environment. Um, and, and the other way to, to go at it is, of course, uh, as a service, as, as a platform service from Amazon. Of course, Google has a, a pretty exhaustive and extensive uh, Kubernetes as a service capability as well as Azure. Uh, so if you're going to do that, it's, you know, as any other past service, you still get to, to you know, interact with Kubernetes, configure your services, and allow Kubernetes to do what it does, but you don't have to deal with any of those underpinnings uh, of the operating system and, and so forth. It's done for you, uh, like any past service would. So it depends on, uh, you know, which direction you're going. If you're, you know, uh, rolling your own or, or a DIY self-operated Kubernetes nodes, uh, there is the security of the host itself. That's obviously very important. Uh, in a lot of cases, people get fixated on the containers. They don't think about the underlying, you know, they, they look at the guest containers. They don't look at, at the host itself. Uh, they don't look at the actual Kubernetes stack 
there are a lot of configuration options and a lot of things that have to happen inside that Kubernetes configuration, as well as the underlying Docker D or Container D configuration uh, to make sure that those containers are running on a secure foundation. Uh, you could think of that as you know making sure that your VMware uh, implementation is secure in addition to the VMs that run on top of it. Uh, and then beyond that, then there's monitoring that platform. Of course, if someone uh, can take privileged control, uh, manages to do that, uh, you know, using a software update, let's say, or something like that, uh, which unfortunately happened recently, uh, the um, the entire environment is compromised at that point. And then yeah. depending on the trust relationships that, that exist between that Kubernetes node and other Kubernetes node or other management tools, uh, that can really be used as a, as a jumping off point. Uh, so that's the other piece that we focus on, you know, for the actual Kubernetes host or node is, you know, monitoring intrusion detection, use of privileges or people running Kubernetes related commands uh, that are doing interesting things or things that you wouldn't expect. How is Kubernetes reacting to that? So there's the whole Kubernetes log stream that, that you want to monitor as well. So that's all the sort of roll your own, if you will. Similar but less on the, the EKS or the Kubernetes as a service offerings that are out there from the IS providers, uh, you need to look at the configuration of the service itself. So there is some configuration depending on which service provider you're using, which specific services you're using, which runtime you're using. Uh, of course, Kubernetes can launch uh, you know, uh, containers into a variety of, of runtime environments. Uh, you could be using Fargate, you could be using ECS. So the configuration of all of those services is very important, and we do that through our CSPM solution, Cloud Secure. Uh, and then, of course, the containers themselves, in both cases, when you get above that point, uh, you get commonality. Then you're concerned about the configuration of the containers, uh, the parameters with which they're being uh, instantiated. You're concerned about what's inside those containers. Are they known containers? Have they been you know, scanned? Have they been assessed for configuration? All of those things are really the shift left strategy that you hear lots about uh, in which you're enabling, you're really putting the tools out there to enable the DevOps teams to uh, keep up with their own uh, hygiene and make sure that the containers that they're pushing down that pipeline that end up in those production environments uh, are appropriately secured and don't have exposures that could cause the obvious uh, you know, frontline uh, incidents. Let, let me propose a layer model and tell me if this makes you cringe. <laughs> it might be wrong. Let's see what I have in my head and tell me it's right. Like I'm really? thinking that to do th this right in the cloud, let's say we're pushing out some, some uh, workload to the cloud. So I would need the container security. I probably need the management around it. Like the, I need Docker, I need Kubernetes. I need That's server right. protection, then I need infrastructure protection. Maybe even then I need network. Like, do I have those layers right? Is that how you guys sell? Is it is it a layered kind of concept like that? It, it is, uh, and and again, it it that gives flexibility. So you know, much like the shared responsibility model, you know, we've tried to provide capabilities that operate the same way as you move further down uh, in the layer. So the further left, if you think about that staircase model as you as you move you know uh, further you know left you get more further to the right where you're using past services uh you know there's less that you have to do but you can still use the common layers on top so that layered model is exactly how we've approached it um and and the key segregation points are exactly the ones kind of the demarcations there's the network there's the infrastructure itself um if you have a physical environment of course there's physical security the guns and guards and then you move into network, you know, uh, the, the, the virtualization layer, whether that be Docker or whatever. We do, we have seen companies that are running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. So there could be a, even another layer inside there uh, or VMware. So, so looking at it from a layered perspective is exactly the right move. Um, we, we have our CSPM cloud secure capability, our server secure capability for on-prem and cloud-based servers. And then we have the container secure capability, which runs really deep, but given how much flexibility there is and how container environments are deployed, uh, that really sort of speaks to the need to have, you know, all those capabilities in a single platform because the lines blur very, very quickly, uh, particularly in large organizations where a DevOps team may choose to use infrastructure as a service as opposed to rolling their own. You've probably got a very wide range of deployment models. Uh, so, you, you know, the security team needs the ability to have a single capability to see it all and, and to be able to interact with it all and, and do what it needs to do. So that's, as always, what we focused on, provide the full platform, make it flexible, uh, so the security team can say yes to whatever uh, happens to come up. 
Yeah, what, what, what's been your experience with multi-cloud? Like you, you mentioned Google. I'm guessing most of your customers pretty promiscuous amongst a, a lot of different cloud services and SaaS. And yeah. <laughs> that's it. We've all, uh, you know, it's almost like we've gotten drunk with all the cloud services. Maybe that'll change. But do you, do you see everyone kind of dancing around lots of different clouds and having that problem? Yeah, we call it a rational exuberance sometimes. It's true. <laughs> the thing to remember is, uh, yeah, you know what that means too. <laughs> Some of our <laughs> um, but uh, those were those were rough days. But uh, you know, the thing to to keep in mind about, you know, a lot of security teams that haven't really been engaged in these models yet will ask us, you know, well, how how are these teams? We'll talk about that very topic. And they sort of think, well, they all report to the CIO, so why doesn't the CIO just, you know, uh, drop the hammer or lay down the law or whatever? But the reality is that that you know, cloud and DevOps has shifted both the operational models and the operational authority away from the CIO to business units. So many of these DevOps teams report to the business unit, yeah. uh, and so they have a different master now, and and so they don't have a common uh, people's court they can go to and, and uh, you know, request adjudication on a, on a conflict, you know, the, the, some DevOps teams are, are, you know, somewhere between independent and rebellious. Many DevOps teams want to work with security. Uh, DevOps teams don't avoid security because they think it's dumb or, or, or anything like that. They, they know it's needed, uh, but in many cases, the legacy tools are just too hard to use. It's, it's, um, it's giant square peg uh, and small round hole. It's just impossible to make those old technologies work. So, uh, so there's you know layer eight friction, right? As we used to say, uh, and, and there's a lot of operational friction there. So they, they are independent, and they will decide what's the best thing for their particular application. And the business units typically say, of course, you know, you do what's best for our business, and um, the security team will figure it out. So they they do have to be able to handle anything that comes their way, and particularly for organizations that have more than say four or five, ten DevOps teams that are distributed into business units. Uh, they're going to have a variety. It's it's going to be a smorgasbord. You know, a moment ago you you'd referenced CSPM, uh, Cloud Security Posture Management. I'm curious what your thoughts are. That that's like a a very popular yes. kind of uh, reference now. Maybe, maybe give a little sense of um, is that just visibility or is it, or is there something more to CSPM? It's mainly visibility uh, for the most part. Uh, there I is some say just I, visibility. <laughs> visibility is important, for sure. Um, you know, we're actually working on for next year uh, some threat detection capabilities as well. Uh, so that's on the docket. Uh, but then, but you know, with with CSPM, you know, there's there's not the whole point of using a PaaS service and an IS service is for the the user to have to do less. That's the idea. Uh, so you know, the the ops team can focus on scaling the application and automating you know uh, code deployments and things like that, and not thinking about power and you know. Uh, infrastructure to run virtualization and all that stuff. Uh, and in the case of PaaS services, they're not even thinking about the, the actual stack, you know, whether it's a database stack or whatever. So, you know, the, the flip side of that is there's less to do for security because there's not as much stuff, you know, with those lower layers that they have to interact with, they have to keep an eye on. So, you know, CSPM uh, seems simpler and easier, more straightforward, but it, it is a really important thing to do in an automated way because of speed. And, and that's the thing that really a lot of security organizations can get blindsided by is just the blinding speed with which these teams can change that infrastructure environment. Entire new application environments can be spun up in minutes. You can scale up and down extremely rapidly. And, you know, from the perspective of a Kubernetes node or something like that, that's just more containers. It's easy. It's automated. It's transparent. From a risk perspective, every container or every server represents more attackable surface area. So all of those changes uh, that happen so quickly, you know, you really have to have automation to get it done. So we, you know, we've seen uh, a couple of folks try to write their own CSPM capabilities on the surface. It sounds easy. You know, connect to the API, you get some stuff, you can pair some rules. Making it scale uh, is very hard to do and normalizing the data across cloud providers. That's the other thing that's, that's really tough about it. And that's a moving target. So that's the kind of thing that our customers would prefer we deal with for them, uh, as opposed to them, you know, really uh, having to deal with it themselves ongoing. These things are like puppies. Uh, they're cute when they're small, but when you have to own that project and that, you know, home built technology for a long time, uh, they, they might not be so much fun, you know, as they grow up and get a little messier.
You know, I want to talk to you about compliance. I know that's an important uh, value prop for your uh, your platform. My observation is that the um, assessment and audit community, regulatory community, struggles with cloud. You know, when you look at the frameworks, <laughs> even sometimes the terminology seems kind of old-fashioned. Like I, I know it's hard to innovate and also standardize on frameworks. But what, what's been your advice? I'm guessing a lot of your platform customers are driven by compliance needs. What, what, what's been your observation? Is there a, is, yeah. Are they converging? Are there, is the compliance community kind of catching up to where the um, technology community is in, in terms of cloud? In yeah, in places. I mean, the, the good thing about most of the standards out there, um, if you look at the regulatory standards like HIPAA, um, even SOC 2, which isn't really regulatory, it's more you know industry driven, those don't really get technically prescriptive. So that's the good news. You know, HIPAA or um, a lot of the PII, you know, uh, you know, protections of the laws that protect personal information that we see, they don't say thou shalt configure X as Y. They say thou shalt have a technical standard, and and that's it. Uh, and it's up to the to the the you know uh, the target of that audit to have de determined what the technical standard is that they use. Now, in terms of technical standards, the organization that we work with the most, uh, that our customers ask about the most, is the Center for Internet Security. And they have done a really spectacular job um, in, in, in getting, you know, and keeping up with not just server security, which has been an issue, of course, for, for decades, but right. also structure as a service, the past services, the container environments. They've really done a good job with, and they've really focused on keeping up uh, with these these new you know these new technologies that are out, so they're they're very comprehensive, they're very prescriptive. Uh, they provide you know a lot of remedial detail, a lot of rationale. They provide very specific, uh, even manual auditing steps. So if you do have a situation where an auditor or a system owner wants to do a manual audit to, to validate that the automation is right, you know if there's a conflict, um, they've really got it right. So we're big fans of CIS. And so what we see a lot of customers do is they'll say we have HIPAA, we have SOC 2, uh, we have some other regulatory standard, um, and, and, and they will take, they will make the decision to adopt CIS as the technical standard that fulfills the regulatory policy. And that works very well. Uh, so we're big fans of the CIS. Uh, there are others out there that are doing a pretty good job, but we're just seeing uh, people are just, you know, that's not a personal opinion. That's just, you know, what we see. No, I'm, people... glad, I'm glad you like that. I, I was on the found, I was a founding member of the board there. So for, for oh. sometimes so I've always been a, I mean, what we find with CIS is it's a nice, um, it's an accessible standard. You know, that's it's right. not like 800-53 and saying, you know, see you in a month. Good luck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes you have no choice but to do that. But right. CIS right. is the kind of thing you can digest. You can hang the poster in your office and kind of figure out what um, you're yeah. doing. Now, Carson, I want you to take out your crystal ball. I know uh, I've, I've asked you this many times in the past, but what, and you're usually pretty on the money. So let, let's hear your uh, predictions for, we're on the cusp of 2021. What are, what are some things you see in our industry and in cloud and so on uh, I mean, that's I, coming in? One thing we'll see, you know, um, you're going to see more past usage. I think that's going to happen pretty quickly. So there's been, um, you know, as past was fledgling, there were, you know, th there were two issues with it. One was, you know, it wasn't granular enough. So you would have an application pass that you just uploaded your, your Rails code, for example, and your data to, you know, some data, SQL, MySQL database endpoint. And that was really it. And you didn't have a lot of ability to configure and tune uh, for, you know, things like performance. That's changed a lot. So now the past services, there are databases as a service. There's container runtime as a service. There's mm -hmm. container registry as a service. There's DNS as a service. And, and there's enough granularity there that they become building blocks. So you don't have to buy the whole wall. You can just buy the brick that you need. And so, you know, I think that that has opened up pass adoption a lot. Uh, you know, the, the innovative companies out there uh, have already gone that route, and, and we're seeing a lot more mainstream companies uh, getting there as well. You know, one of the things that is always an impediment to adoption of a particular technology is the amount of talent available in the talent pool industry-wide. And so we've seen a lot more, uh, you know, education organizations that are releasing pass training. 
of course, AWS and Azure and Google, these guys are all doing great jobs of providing training, access to free environments for people to learn how to use these past services. So I, I think you're going to see a lot more uh, pass you know, adoption, and, and that's going to change, you know, really change the, the direction uh, that security is going to focus. Of course, they're going to have those legacy environments. Uh, you know, their mainframes are still around. You know, we, we've got multiple customers that still have tandems. So servers are not going to just vanish into the ether. Uh, but but the you know if you think about a, one of those sand table toys you know it's shifting towards you know pass and serverless you're going to see a lot more of that um, I think you're going to start to see a lot more uh, you know codeless application platform mm -hmm. emerge so that's started to emerge there's you know there are, there are you know services out there now that are focusing on uh, software as a service and the way that we focus on uh, you know infrastructure as a service. That's something I think we're going to see a lot more adoption of, and and I think the impact there is going to be, uh, you know, public cloud infrastructure uh, to the power of, of three or four, because then it's not going to be a DevOps team, a single team with a business unit that's doing something. It's going to be any business user that can develop their own applications. That's the idea: is to just cut out the middleman completely. Uh, where before, you know, when you wrote an application, you had the network guy, you had the systems guy, you had the application guy, the data, you know, you had all these people, you know, that, that, that had to be involved. And eventually you got to the business analyst with codeless application development, uh, which is something that's been around for a while, but it's starting to kind of come into its own. None of those people even have to be there. You know, the business unit can, can just go at it and, and build applications. I think what you'll see is internal applications that that are the primary target uh, for that sort of thing. And um, you know, Google has, has been doing a lot with you know Google Sheets and you know to try to to take people from okay, you know how to use a spreadsheet. Now let's add some forms to it and look how easy that was. And, and so I think you're going to see quite a bit of that. Um, I think that both the infrastructure as a service and and the codeless application development trends. Both of those are going to continue to drive, which is probably the most relevant thing to, to the CISOs and the, the uh, security management and the leaders that are, that are watching. That's going to change the operational model dramatically. Um, and, and the reason for that is, you know, the, the security organization 10 years ago, as you know, as, as uh, you know, at scale as, as the, the CISO ATT, you know, you've got nation states. You know, we used to have a nation state called security, information security. We had a nation state called development. We had a nation state called, you know, data center operations. And so those, th there were VPs at the top of each of those, and they all reported up to the CIO. Now you have these DevOps teams. And so the operating model now, if you, if you sort of take the idea of, you know, structured nation states with protocols and hotlines to each other and things like that, now we've got tribes, you know, we've got little tribes everywhere of DevOps people um, that are that are doing these things really fast. Uh, you know, again, they're they're very independent, uh, and and they can be very independent. There, there's not a, a common you know leader at the top that they can go resolve issues with. So that's different. When when you have to when you when you have to influence without authority, which is what security teams have to do now, you have to think of those teams as customers. So I think that 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 shift in operations. Uh, and, and, and a shift in the way that security teams think about how they interact with the other uh, technology leadership and, and you know, engineering teams, that's going to continue to change. And with that adoption of, of uh, codeless application development, that's going to become even more complex. Now you're talking about an end user problem. So if you think about the challenges of getting end users uh, to you know, do what is needed to meet compliance and security requirements, that's a tall order. And, and once they can develop their own applications, it's going to be very interesting. I, I think the, the choke point, which, I, you know, I don't like the term choke point uh, because it, uh, it, it, it denotes conflict. And I do think it's going to be messy for a while is going to be the data sources. Uh, you know, so if, this, if, if security teams, I think their knee jerk reaction is going to be, well, let's not let them have the data and they can't write an application. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, with the amount of SaaS services that are already in place, that those business units can just sort of go around them uh, and build their own data pools, uh, which, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch. It's going to be an interesting set of new problems uh, that that kind of amplify this trend uh, in, in organizational and operational shift and, and, and authority shift, for sure. I mean, those sound like very likely predictions because we already see the beginnings of those. That, 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 they, that sounds like a 
a pretty accurate uh, glimpse into what we're likely to see, especially well, with COVID. Well, yeah, well, we no, do. No, no question that that's going to happen. Let me ask you a real broad question. Do you, do you ever worry about the big public clouds, you know, exploding? <laughs> it seems like there's so uh, much, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're taking on a lot. I, I know what that was like. And, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I just you ever worry about that? The, the three biggies, and they're all they, each year they seem to be doubling or tripling. And what, what, yeah. what should we be worried about that? I think that anytime you've got that much data and that much uh, responsibility for the security of that data concentrated in one place, it, it is a concern uh, yeah. for sure. But you know that said, you know uh, the, the the providers know what's at stake. Uh, and they and they have done a really good job over the years. So you know, I don't sort of sit awake at night worrying about you know uh, somebody you know gross compromise of Google or gross compromise of Amazon or something like that. They do a really exceptional job. And, they are and good. Yeah. They do. And and the the thing that I think about is if you compare the the overall amount of you know uh, investment in people and technology and process that they put into their entire infrastructure. It's more than most companies can could ever even consider doing, you know. So, so the, the they've got massive security teams, and and they really know what they're doing, and they've had a long time to figure it out. So, and from that from that regard, the question really becomes: Do we think that you know uh, fifty thousand companies separately can do it any better? I think that yeah. that's the tend to think about. I don't think they can. Yeah, I think you. I think there's a cooperation. I mean, certainly there's a responsibility. Yeah. For the enterprise, yeah. they need to be picking good platforms and tools and be, follow right. good practice. But in terms of the underlying infrastructure, the economics make almost no, it makes about as much sense as building your own wireless network. You know, if you're not yeah. going to do that, then it doesn't Absolutely. make sense to build cloud. It's going to be a heck of an interesting year next year. I'll tell you what. I, one thing that I know is that um, you, in particular, in certain cloud passage, you guys will continue to be uh, pretty iconic. I've learned so much from you over the years and just watching it. the work that you do and the evolution of your platform, it's been one of the um, one of the re real joys in, in doing cloud security, just coordinating that. with you guys. So it's, it's been, been great. The customers. You know, we've learned so much from our customers and they still won't let us say their names uh, in public. <laughs> but uh, but we've, you know, we've learned from some of the absolute best uh, and, uh, you know, some of those could be inferred by our relationship, obviously, but, uh, um, you know, we've learned from them and uh, there's there's nothing like real world experience. Uh, so you can go off and cook up an idea in a vacuum and, uh, you know, bring it bring it out and end up with an Edsel. You know, uh, it, you're not out there really with the users. Uh, we've been very fortunate that some of the best, you know, and largest in the cloud have, have worked with us for years. And have fed us that information. So we're very fortunate to have been able to do that. And we look forward to keeping keeping that path going. A lot of work done, a lot to do. And we'll be we'll be pretty busy next year. So well listen, now on behalf of my team at Tag Cyber and all the people watching, I want to thank you for uh, taking some time. I know you don't do a lot of uh, videos, so I'm honored that you took the That's time. Great. We got a good 30 minutes of Carson Sweet, and I, I always Respect. learn something new. Uh, the NSA is probably already left. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us broke the camera, right? It still seems to be working. So, but I well, listen, thank, thank, no, it was great. It was wonderful catching up, and um, I'll have to get one of those sweaters for the next time we All talk. Right. I'll see if there's an extra one uh, in my closet somewhere. Have a great holiday season, Ed, and uh, for all the viewers out there, uh, have a great holiday season yourselves. That's great. Thanks, Carson. And for everyone watching, we'll see you next time.